Thanks, everyone. Um, my name is Matthew Lewis. I'm the Director of Communications for the Risky Business Project and Vice President and Director of Communications at Next Generation, which is a think tank based here in San Francisco. And this morning we're going to be talking about um, measuring resilience and the metrics for resilience in cities. Um, and uh, we're very lucky to have a, a, an excellent panel. Um, they're going to be presenting some of their research on metrics for cities this morning. Um, we have uh, Aidan Hughes from Arup uh, here, uh, Eileen Marinin from the Grosvenor Group, and um, Alex Kaplan from Swiss Re. Uh, and they'll each be giving a brief presentation, and then we'll, we'll go through a Q&A. Um, I was asked to talk briefly about the Risky Business Project. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, it was an effort to assess the economic risks of climate change in the United States. And uh, of necessity, um, those risks accrue, and, and, and just out of uh, happenstance, accrue disproportionately to urban areas and to cities where most infrastructure is located, most businesses are located, most capital is being deployed. Um, and what we found is that there are significant economic risks across the country uh, from climate change, but that they vary widely by region. Um, and it shouldn't be a surprise to anyone that, that climate change impacts uh, are, are diverged broadly by geographic location. Uh, of course, climate change is a very regional problem. But surprisingly, um, no one had ever actually taken the step of saying, well, what's the difference between uh, sea level rise in, say, Seattle and Miami? And it's actually significant. Uh, the impacts in terms of the, 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 the assets that are, that are at stake, the infrastructure that is, that's at stake, both in terms of just the expected sea level rise from climate change, but also the way those states and cities are managing their infrastructure and planning for the future. Um, and I think one of the critical components of that that we'll be talking about today is how, to, how do you both measure expected impacts and use history and, 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 and backcasting uh, of experience to sort of get a sense of what your exposure is? And then what's the appropriate set of metrics to use to forecast what's expected and to plan for resilience um, in the future? And so I think that's in broad brushstrokes what we wanna, wanna talk about. And so we're gonna start, I, don't, I can't remember who's going first, we're gonna start with uh, Alex uh, from Swiss Re. Um, so Alex, please. Sure, thanks, Matt. Uh, appreciate it. Uh, so Alex Kaplan with Swiss Re. Um, I was going to take a poll right uh, off the bat and see how many people knew what reinsurance was, but based on the last panel, I think I'll spare us uh, that. Uh, but but for those that don't know, so Swiss Re is a, is a leading global reinsurer. We look at uh, uh, pooling and retaining risk from all corners of the globe, uh, from every sector of the economy. And uh, I'm on a team called Global Partnerships, and that may not mean anything right off the bat, but the goal of, of the Global Partnerships team is to work exclusively with governments at all levels, from municipalities up to the federal governments, to help them identify uh, and capture the risk that they face, and then pull it into the private market. So take the risk of natural disasters, for example, take it off the back of the taxpayer and put it in the private market, since the overwhelming majority of losses are not, uh, not insured on a global basis, only roughly about 30%. So I know the, the, the panel is, is, uh, is called uh, measuring success, but I think one of the things we have to think about is in order to measure success, you may first want to measure what failure looks like. Um, so uh, we'll give a little bit of a scenario of, of Swiss Re's Mind the Risk Report, which came out uh, late last year. So. As you probably all know, uh, natural disasters have, have doubled in cost uh, twice since the 1970s. Since from 1970 to 1990, the average annual cost of natural disasters globally was about 25 billion. And from 1990 to 2010, I believe, the average annual loss was $100 billion. So we know the direction we're going. And if you compound that against the fact that every five days, a million people move from rural settings into cities, and they're moving into the most disaster prone areas along our coastlines, along our riverbeds, and in seismic, seismically prone areas, we have a challenge on our hands, but we all know this. So what we decided to do was uh, issue a report where we actually do a global ranking of cities against uh, natural disaster exp uh, exposure. We looked at earthquake, windstorm, river, uh, river flood, uh, storm surge, and tsunami risk. We looked at the 616 biggest cities around the globe. I don't know why 616 is the number. I think it's all cities over 750,000 uh, inhabitants. Uh, and that group of cities makes up 25% of global population, 
but 50% of global GDP. So these are really the economic drivers of our, of our national economies. And that's why having this conversation about urban resilience is so incredibly important. And we take these cities and we sort of uh, look at their exposure to those natural disasters, look at their economic contributions, multiplied by their population to sort of come up with different scenarios. So our methodology, we use our probabilistic uh, proprietary models um, using collecting all the hazard information we have. We compare that in a standardized basis uh, with the vulnerabilities uh, and conditions in the various uh, locations. We look at the exposure. So using satellite imagery, we're looking at what are the boundaries of these cities, right? A city just doesn't end at the city limits, for example, of San Francisco, but, but the Bay Area as a whole, we're looking at as a metropolitan area. Uh, and then the distribution of that population. And then, of course, we're doing the global ranking. So what does, what does the population look like against the hazard, against its economic contribution, both locally, globally, and nationally? And this is just a, a cool shot of, of a, a capture from our internal model, which is, which is really capturing all the exposures, the natural disaster exposures uh, in North America, everything from seismic risk to volcanic to the tracks of tens of thousands of, of windstorms that have occurred over, uh, I think actually that's only since 1981. Um, and so uh, this is, this is the, the data that's going into the model and can help visualize what the, what the true risks are in particular jurisdictions. Obviously, this is low resolution. It's very high up. And you, know, you can't even really see the river flood exposure. You'd, you'd have to really drill down and, and get in there, but you can see it on a very localized basis. And this is using Swiss Re's global flood zones. Uh, we've actually been able to develop these zones to map out the entire world's hazard. Obviously, in the US, we have FEMA flood maps. And we use those, uh, but outside of uh, outside of the U.S., where it may not be as developed, we're we're using our our own proprietary uh, flood zones. And so this is a snapshot of what the report looks like just for for cities in North America. Uh, what you see is basically the size of the circle um, is an indication of the population, and then the breakdown of the different colorings. Uh, for example, looking at California, the 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 big one that stands out there is, is Los Angeles, and that the red is earthquake, um, and the blue is river flood. So while a city may be thinking that their biggest risk uh, is earthquake or whatever it may be, uh, we want to help use this as an opportunity to remind them that that's not their only exposure. Mexico City has substantial earthquake exposure. They know that since 1985 when they had the, the massive earthquake. But the overwhelming majority of their population is actually exposed, exposed to river flood. And so then what does this mean uh, on the broader scale? So what we're, what we're taking is, is now we're taking GDP data uh, on a localized basis, and we're calculating the impact that in a disaster has on the ability for people to get to work, right? And how long a city may be out of commission after a major earthquake. So you're basically taking GDP per person in that, in that geography based upon the population impacted. And then now we're able to rank the cities. Of course, the, uh, the headlines that came out in the USA Today when this report came out is that you know, Tokyo had, uh, Godzilla is the least of Tokyo's worries. Um, they are the worst city in the world for natural disaster exposure. I don't think that's exactly what we intended people to take away from that. Uh, but, but this is just looking at, at North America and you can see that in terms of the value of working days loss as a result of all the natural disasters we're talking about, not just earthquake in this case, Los Angeles overwhelmingly impacted the most. Uh, that's on a global scale. And that, again, just looking at North American cities. And then the bottom graph there, the yellow, is looking at uh, working days loss in comparison to the national economy. Now, this is important to look at because now that helps not only local officials and state officials plan resilience within those cities and figure out what uh, exposures and vulnerabilities they need to be focusing on, but now hopefully that helps federal, uh, the federal governments identify where they need to be putting some of their focus. So this is a very confusing chart, which <laughs> I will attempt to explain. <laughs> But basically, again, the bigger the size of the circle is an indication of the population impacted. This is showing the Americas as a whole, okay? So North and South America. The further right 
is an indication of its impact on GDP for that event. So you got, again, Los Angeles si si sitting out there on the right, and that's an indication of the impact to GDP as a result of a major earthquake in Los Angeles. Now, you've got a lot of really small circles. You've got some small circles that are higher up. So let me take, for example, I think, I can't see it very well, but I think that's um, oh, Santo Domingo in Costa Rica. Now, why is that at the top? Well, Santo Domingo uh, in, in, thank you. <laughs> thank you for that. San Jose, <laughs> totally different city, um, makes up the vast majority of the Costa Rican economy. If there is a major earthquake in San Jose, the national economy is likely going to be crippled, right? You know, you think about New York. New York is a big city. It has a tremendous amount of contribution to the U.S. economy. We saw what happened with Sandy, but it makes up 8 to 9 percent of U.S. GDP. So the U.S. system can absorb that exposure. But these cities in other countries need to be thinking about the resilience of their capital cities or their biggest cities in comparison to the national economy. And so this hopefully puts some context around, again, their exposure and help put a laser focus on what they need to, to put their attention to. So that, that again, is uh, measuring what the worst case scenario is, the, 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 what failure looks like. And uh, I'll turn it over to my colleagues here to explain what success looks like. Thanks very much, Alex. And um, when we were preparing for this panel, um, Alex was the, um, the voice of no slides. <laughs> but I guess, I guess I win because uh, the Arab logo gets <laughs> on every one of your slides. I don't know if you noticed that. <laughs> so, Thanks for that. <laughs> <laughs> so that's success. <laughs> let, let me... Um, so my name is Aidan Hughes. I'm a principal with Arup in San Francisco. And Arup is a global firm, uh, 12,000 people um, with offices all over the world, um, specializing in engineering, planning, and consulting. And for many years, we've worked um, in the resilience space with the Rockefeller Foundation. And um, I'm as much here to represent the Rockefeller Foundation and their efforts, as well as the work that we've done with them on the City Resilience Framework. And um, Nancy Keat, who's MD of the Rockefeller Foundation, wasn't able to be here today, but um, she's certainly been the inspiration for all of the work that, that we've done. So um, a little bit about the City Resilience Framework. The, the, um, what you, what you see in front of you is uh, the result of uh, more than 12 months worth of work heavily researched, including um, case studies in, in six cities uh, around the world. And the intention was to provide a comprehensive baseline by which cities could measure their resilience. And in measuring their resilience, there was a intentional uh, there was an intention not then to rank cities, but simply that allow this to be a framework so that, um, so that cities can, uh, can provi prevent, provide themselves with a baseline. And I think the ranking, when you're looking globally, um, begins to lose meaning, but also kind of highlights some of the things that we already know, which is that some of the cities, for example, uh, in Africa will end up at the bottom of the list and the more in the more developed cities will end up at the top. So as a ranking, it's, it doesn't help, but as a baseline, uh, I think it's, it is really helpful. Having developed the framework, and, and the framework has now been released, uh, the, the next piece of work is to work on the, uh, the City Resilience Index. And what you see in front of you, that around the edge of the circle are the four categories to um, baseline resilience, uh, leadership and strategy, health and well-being, economy and society, and infrastructure and environment. That drills down into 12 indicators, 50 sub-indicators, and 150 variables. I'm not going to read all of those. <laughs> um, but the, you, you can see that it, it very quickly gets down to, um, to a very fine grain of resilience. 
And the other, I think, distinction between this framework and index and others, uh, and I was very interested to hear the discussion this morning about the definition of resilience, is that this framework and the definition of resilience is intentionally broad. It's not just about um, climate change or the impacts of um, natural disaster. And when you think globally, it begins to address issues that perhaps um, in the US we don't think of in terms of resilience, such as resilience to epidemic, illiteracy, lawlessness, and so on. So um, it's intentionally broad and it's intentionally global. Uh, it's still, we feel, applicable to any city, uh, but, it, but I think it's an important distinction and we perhaps picked that up in some of the conversations that we have. The applicability of this framework is that the uh, Rockefeller Foundation have a program, the 100 Resilient Cities Program, and they're rolling out that program right now and working with, I think, actively now working with 30 of those cities uh, and using this as one of their tools to allow cities to develop their baseline resilience. And um, San Francisco, Patrick is here from the city of San Francisco, um, and the city of San Francisco will be using this as one of their tools to, to baseline. So I think that's all that I want to say just to introduce the framework and the index and, and we can pick up the uh, conversation as we go. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks. I just want to remind folks standing over here that there's plenty of chairs on this end of the room. If anybody's looking for a seat, um, please come on in and join us. Oops. Thanks. Okay, let me start by introducing myself and the Grosvenor Group. Um, I am Eileen Marinin. I'm the Director of Research for Grosvenor Amer Americas here in San Francisco. Um, but the Grosvenor Group is a larger umbrella organization. It's a privately held real estate investor and developer that's based in London in the UK. Um, Grosvenor has been in existence for over 300 years, but we've been diversified outside of the UK for only about 50 years. And in fact, we first diversified into North America. So we've been in, um, right now we're invested in nine cities in the US and two in Canada. And um, so I'm the director of research for Grosvenor Americas. Um, we became interested in doing um, an analysis of city resilience as part, um, this was originated in the UK headquarters. Um, it was jointly done by the research team there and the sustainability team. And our whole focus is we are long-term institutional investors in cities. And you know, we do the classic risk return analysis, capital allocation analysis, just like any other real estate investor, and started feeling about five years ago that that wasn't really enough. And the whole idea of doing a resiliency study originated, as I said, in headquarters in the UK. And the concept was to expand the way we think of risk and return to include things like um, resiliency. And I'm sure a lot of the backdrop for that was that we had a large number of natural disasters, say, in the last five years. So the backdrop for that, obviously, um, was going on while they developed this. And I would also say, having sort of received this from, from the UK, um, it's been interesting to talk to all the people that were closely involved in developing the study, because it clearly evolved as an organic process, I would say. And just to start out, I mean, they started acknowledging that when they looked at risk and tried to measure it and incorporate it into the capital allocation and just the larger investment analysis, they were missing a lot of things. You know, you're not just looking at standard deviation of returns. That's not really capturing what's going on in the larger world. And as I said, you know, we're very long-term investors in our cities um, and are actively involved in trying to maintain them as desirable investment locations. It's good for the residents. It's good for us as investors. And so they started out trying to measure the vulnerability of individual cities. And there are 50 cities um, around the world that we track regularly in terms of demographics and economics and a number of other variables that we have been considering for years as we do our decision making. So 
there was a lot of work done on assembling and working with vulnerability. And then they felt you know, that really wasn't sufficient. So then the second step was to consider the adaptive capacity of cities. So what is their vulnerability to natural disasters, to any kind of social um, issues, and also to um, just climate change? Uh, and then how are they able to deal with it? Can they prevent it? Can they mitigate it? How quickly can they bounce back from any kind of dislocation? And that ended up creating at the end of the process, you know, a ranking of the 50 cities that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. So just to kind of walk through, um, and you know, 150 data series must be the magic number because um, our team in London have informed me that in all they've looked at 150 data series, um, but they have them basically grouped into you know the categories for vulnerability were five, um, and they look at climate change, they look at environmental environmental degradation issues like air, water pollution, um, urban sprawl. They considered things like. Um, Infrastructure adequacy, uh, resources as they define it was um, resource security. Is there sufficient food, water, utilities? Um, what about the community? Do they have um, good community institutions, et cetera? And all of these were rolled up into a ranking. And uh, so this is the vulnerability half of it, the vulnerability ranking of the 50 metros. I'm sorry, that's not as clear as I would like it to be, perhaps. But you know, in looking at this, I just want to point out, it's a little bit the reverse of what you would ordinarily think. The highest vulnerability ranking are the least vulnerable communities. So then the second step in the process, which was added on, was what is the ability of each of these cities to actually deal with anything that comes their way? And again, they broke out all of the data series that they dealt with and incorporated into the analysis into five different categories. And they looked at things like you know, the governance of the communities. Do they have the rule of law? Is there transparency? They looked at issues like corruption. Um, do they have uh, good financing structures? Do they have access to financing when they need it? Um, do they have planning systems in place? Are they hooked into the international agencies that do monitoring? Um, you know, do they have local institutions that they can interface with to be state of the art um, as they go forward with their planning and their work? And just trying to capture, there are definitely social as well as environmental aspects to a lot of the analysis that was done, um, which we feel, you know, in the long term, if you've got responsive government, if you've got transparency, if you've got a lot of these things built into the city, then you have a better long-term functioning city. So all of these things have been wrapped in. We've got an adaptive capacity score. And then they rolled these together into an overall score for each of the cities on resilience. And in looking at these, um, you know, we basically have, I would say, just roughly speaking, out of the 50, the top 30 in the upper right tend to be the developed countries. And, um, Interestingly, you know, Canada and the US metro areas tend to do extremely well. Canada, because they had lower vulnerability, um, and the US metros, because they had superior um, adaptive capacity, you know, relatively speaking. The ones in the lower left, not surprisingly, um, are from the developed countries. Uh, but I would say, uh, in looking at this, we don't view these as there's a cutoff. For example, we'd only invest in the top 10 or whatever. Not at all. The whole idea was, to provide additional information and you know, improve decision making, essentially. So we would not say we wouldn't invest in any of these places. What we are saying is we're trying to attract, um, or rather track, relevant information that improve our decision making as we invest in these different cities. So you know, that's basically what we've put together in terms of the resilience study. And as I said, the motivation for doing this in the UK was to assist primarily in the capital allocation process. Um, but I think that what has evolved since then, and we've only had it in place for about four months, is that it's becoming viewed as a much broader um, tool that can be applied in a lot of different ways. Um, you can basically look at the rankings the cities have for the different categories of adaptive capacity and vulnerability and sort of look at where we are invested and how our portfolio looks when you look at it from these standpoints to help with our asset and portfolio management efforts. Um, and also uh, one thing I can tell you is that in the latest round of capital allocation, 
because the North America cities had ranked really well, we got an additional capital allocation from the UK and it was partially in recognition of the resilience results. Um, and one of the things they're doing too is we're very heavily invested in London and they've drilled down and looked at a lot of the details of the London analysis. One of the primary areas of vulnerability for London is that it's got a real shortage of affordable housing. We have a new project. They're doing a site assembly in London for a mixed use development and they're going to specifically target affordable price points on the housing um, portion of that to try to be more proactive in London to keep it a, you know, a world city that people want to live in and people want to invest in. Um, so there are a lot of things that are evolving for this study. Um, and we've also started talking now, it's come down to the different regions. We've got the Asia, the Europe, and the North America regional offices. And we're now reviewing the way these were done and trying to figure out how we can tweak them, improve them, and actually work with them with our own internal teams. So it's an ongoing study, it's an ongoing analysis. I, in our senses, although one of the disadvantages, I think, is that you know, they're static, they're sort of a snapshot, um, a point in time analysis, but we intend to refresh this about once every three years. And I think the benefit of doing that um, sort of speaks to something that you had mentioned, um, Aiden, which is you can sort of see, especially in the developing markets, we can start tracking how they're moving. Are they improving in terms of their um, adaptive capacity and improving their desirability uh, for investment? Uh, we actually recently, Kate Brown, our um, sustainability director in London, also participated in a forum that ULI was a co-sponsor on in the spring. It was held in the Philippines and she chaired a session on how the Philippines can rebuild from um, the last typhoon and in doing that, improve its attractiveness for foreign direct investment so they can attract more dollars and retain more dollars. And she said she's getting more and more requests like that from a lot of the developing world, which is a very interesting and unexpected development for us. Mm -hmm. So I'll just leave with that so that we can sort of go on and do question and answer. Um, but that's basically what we have put together at this point. Um, it represents about a two-year effort and it's definitely an ongoing effort. Um, but we'll be very interested to see just how broadly we can apply the results from this study. Thanks. I think we're going to do a little bit of a discussion amongst ourselves, and then we'll open up for questions in, in, in a short bit. Um, if people have burning questions, please, there are microphones. We'd be happy to take them. Uh, the first thing, actually, I, I read each of your reports, and I was struck, Eileen, um, by the question, are, are we all moving to Canada? Um, <laughs> because <laughs> it did seem to have the highest scores. Um, but, the, but on a more serious note, the, there was something else that was in, in the Grosvenor piece um, that really got at a core, and this is something that Risky Business really found in droves when we were trying to figure out uh, why do people keep investing, for example, in large real estate, real estate projects in Miami Beach, um, uh, which is something that is a mystery to many planners in Miami as much as it is uh, to investors, given that there's not, you know, past 2050, be taking those buildings down uh, in, a, in, in, in most probability. The question is how do you square the short, and this is sort of an ongoing question, the short horizon of both political and investment cycles with the inherently long-term nature of resilience planning? I think that's really a good question and that's something we have already started talking about. I will begin by saying Miami is not one of our target markets in the US. <laughs> um, Although we're certainly all over the West Coast, and you know, obviously we've got to deal with uh, earthquakes in California and up the Pacific Rim, and also uh, flooding issues, and you know, rising sea levels. And some of that is, it is difficult. And one of the issues we've dealt with is the fact that the difficulty in doing this at a global level, and it'll be interesting to hear if if Aiden agrees. Um, because we were trying to be more all-encompassing, more broad in our coverage of issues. You know, we definitely have the social, more normative things as well as the more environmental things. Um, is some of the data, you're trying to find data that will be um, you know, consistently collected and presented but covering 50 metros in very different countries all around the world. One of the frustrations for us is we're very interested in starting to invest in Africa. We could not find enough data covering sub-Saharan African cities 
to include them in the analysis. Hmm. So that was a frustration after a lot of brain damage hmm. trying to make that happen, and it didn't. So it'll be interesting to see what Arup has um, on that front. But yeah, that in some ways you have that inherent disadvantage that you, know, you can have a change in administration in the US, and that can make a huge difference for you know, how important are these things, um, you know, what is the strength of the institutional support for this kind of work? And I don't think there is an easy answer for that. Um, I would say, uh, based on the experience already in London in just the couple of months we've had this, is um, because we are very long-term sort of embedded investors in our markets, um, we definitely have already started down the road of sort of figuring out what the big issues are identifying other stakeholders and trying to push in the direction of addressing them in a constructive manner. Mm -hmm. And I think you always have that issue of, you know, data is always look back and this is a look forward mm -hmm. um, intention for us as investors. Alex, just building on this, I think that was a very thoughtful response from Eileen. The, the, obviously the insurance industry as the holder of the risk has a pretty significant role to play in both communicating the kind of metrics that you were presenting earlier but also in influence, trying to influence investment decisions because to the extent the investor doesn't want to carry the risk, they come to someone like you. Where can the insurance industry do more or what, is, what do you feel like its role is in purveying those metrics and helping you know, really influence the process? Because in the case of, let's just stick with Miami for a second, they continue to approve these buildings and the insurers are starting to, to leave. Um, but what's, what's the relationship between those two players and how can, and, and what do you see Swiss, Swiss Re's role in sort of purveying those metrics and helping people make more informed decisions about resilience? Sure, so I, I, think, I think our primary role um, in this whole conversation is putting a price on risk, right? What is, what is the cost of inaction? Um, so, for example, for New York City after Sandy, we, we did the climate analysis uh, for Mayor Bloomberg's resiliency plan and taking in all of their data and uh, all their assets spread across the five boroughs and looking at, um, at, at their exposure from Sandy, but what does our climate exposure look like today versus what does it look like in 2050? And we were able to say to, to the city, um, the cost of climate impacts for the city of New York today is $1.7 billion on an annualized basis, right? So some years you're gonna have a Sandy, some years you're not. But on an annualized basis, you're losing $1.7 billion every single year. And in 2050, if you do nothing, you're gonna lose $4.4 billion every single year. So I think that you know, for the believers and non-believers of climate change, I think, I think putting a price tag on that exposure um, is the main benefit of, of having the insurance industry in that conversation. Um, now, the U.S. is, 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 a, is a difficult uh, geography when you talk about the impact of insurance on decision-making processes because the insurance industry wants to price risk based on the actual risk. And the moment that, um, that people are unwilling to accept the cost of their risk, they want, they want some other alternative. And unfortunately, that alternative has historically been government, right? So we've got the National Flood Insurance Program, which was started back in the 60s. And there is no private market for flood insurance in the United States because the federal government has been taking on that exposure for over 40 years. And they've been underpricing that risk. And as a result, uh, the NFIP is about $25 billion in debt. Now, they're trying to right-size that. That's the, the same scenario plays to a lesser extent, to uh, windstorms. You look up and down the, the coastline of, uh, of, of the Atlantic, but predominantly in the Gulf Coast, a lot of the uninsurable properties, and I, I do put that in quotation marks because I, I, I do believe that a lot of them are insurable, but people are not willing to pay the price that matches the risk, then they get pushed into these state pools and the states end up absorbing some of that risk. But if you're not paying an actuarially based rate or risk-based rate, then that rate is being subsidized, and in the long run, it, it falls on the back of the taxpayer. Um, so to the extent that the, that the insurance market is allowed to operate free of, of um, government subsidies and displacement, I think that our role is to put a price on that risk, mm -hmm. and that will drive decisions. I would love to see people not building $5 million homes on sandbars mm -hmm. anymore. That would be great. Um, but to the extent that they can still get a flood insurance policy from the federal government, 
Yeah. I don't think that's going to stop them. So addressing the moral hazard is sort of exactly the point. I want to I want to shift because something that was in the Arab report that I thought w that was at least enlightening for me uh, was the notion of measuring some of these less tangible attributes. Health and well-being was one of the big quadrants on your on your circle. Can you talk a little bit about the process of measuring those cultural, I, I mean, they, they seem to me like cultural attributes, perhaps that's not the right way to describe them, but the, the, the shifts within cultures that either enable or hinder resilience. And I'm thinking in particular, and this might be a, too much of an aside, but um, a couple years ago, uh, somebody started to notice that, uh, that young people were not getting their driver's licenses. As, they were putting off getting their driver's license, and somebody had the observation, maybe it's due to iPhones. And it was actually a serious observation because people don't want to, they actually want to be sitting on a bus or a train or walking and looking at their phone. And it's this sort of secular change in behavior that leads to other changes. And I just want to use that as a launching off point to ask, what are some of the other ways you measure those types of shifts that are cultural in nature and aren't necessarily just economic or related to assets and infrastructure? Yeah, and I'll, I'll just preface what I'm going to say by the, by the statement that the the index and the indicators are, are being worked on right now, so I, haven't, I don't have an example, an exact example I can use. But the health and well-being um, category uh, covers, you know, human vulnerability, livelihoods and employment, and safeguards to human life and health. Some of the indicators that we will um, look at will be. Um, I, th I think it's not really to, to your point. It's really m about you know access to access to health, access to mm -hmm. employment, um, access to clean water, um, uh, lawlessness or crime rate, mm -hmm. um, and uh, vulnerability because of the um, home construction, affordability of homes. So th the the health and well-being. Um, will kind of drop more into those types of mm -hmm. indicators. And um, rather than kind of research on how do those indicators interact in a kind of yep. data manipulation type way, I think mm -hmm. to your point, once, once you've drilled down and, figured and, and kind of figured out kind of where your benchmark is in terms of all of those indicators, then there's an opportunity for an individual city to look at those and see how they um, interact with some of the other indicators, or whether where they're performing poorly, how can they be improved, and so on. I think that that's uh, that's really where that health and well-being piece is. And I will say, actually, because because Eileen asked the question about Africa, so one of our we did have one of our case study cities was in Africa, but it was I say but it was Cape Town. Mm -hmm. um, and we use Cape Town because we were able, there was more access to data to allow it to be a reasonable case study. So I think that that continues to be a challenge mm -hmm. when you think about measuring resilience globally. Because many, many cities, many communities just, the, there isn't the data that would allow you to, get, to drill down into a lot of detail. That, that might also be true with health and well-being, mm -hmm. where some of the some of the fundamentals of health, access to clean water, might be like the key indicator for resilience. And I assume that would be benchmarked against other economic indicators for that particular? Yeah. Uh, yes, that's true. Um, and in the case studies that we, that we did, I think some of the interesting findings, um, for example, in Concepcion in Chile that suffered major earthquake recently, mm -hmm. the, um, following the earthquake, there was, there was huge social upheaval, um, a lot of looting and lawlessness and so on. The longer term impacts of that earthquake will be felt because of the social upheaval and not because of the earthquake. And I think those, that sense of how to measure resilience and what's important to a community or a city or a society um, came out of the research that we did. Mm -hmm. yeah. Interesting. Yeah, and I would say Katrina is an example closer to home of the same thing in New Orleans with all the issues that arose immediately after that. 
I, I want to follow up on that, Eileen, because something that was that came through in the in the Grosvenor report that mm -hmm. I found um, refreshing for a, a, a investment private sector firm to sort of be very forthright in talking about is the role of good governance in both fostering resilience, but in, in laying the foundation for the private sector to invest appropriately in those areas. How do you, as an, on the investor side, what are the what are the methods you use to figure out um, the influencers of government outcomes? Because as you know, these are very cyclical. Uh, they do often, they're often short term, but you have, we have abundant examples on the successes of cities that actually took a longer view. What were the precursors to those successes and how do you help foster them or identify them, particularly coming from a private sector role where that's not really your role? Well, I was going to say, yeah, you can't you can't accomplish everything on your own, certainly. But right. And just in terms of trying to kind of capture those things and and look at the cities from that perspective, um, you know, it's difficult. Obviously, you've got the data issues. We have you know the transparency measures and um, looking at things like you know accountability and everything else. Um, you know, and I would say, to the extent that you can. If you're a significant player in the market, I would say you know we definitely are that in London. Um, we've been there for a long time. We are major holders of real estate there, and uh, so we are involved in a lot of the uh, things that go on there. Um, in other places, we would definitely have to be more proactive and become involved with other, mm -hmm. you know, like-minded investors. You know, you get into that whole issue that we always get with real estate is you know finding people with an alignment of interests. And you have to be sufficiently motivated to actually step up and try to do something like that. And it gets very touchy, you know, especially, and we're developers as well as investors. Yeah. So, you know, you get into the whole conflicts of interest and, you know, are you really being uh, kind of an objective third party helper of the process or do you have an agenda? So it's tricky. What's your, just to follow on, what is your sense within, on the investment and development side? Is there a growing, consensus about these types of metrics for resilience? Are, are people looking at, you know, one of the things that you mentioned over and over again in the, in the report was this notion of the longer term viability of some of these investments um, based on resilience measures. And that's something that, it, in my impression, is not very broadly disseminated within the investment and developer community, or do I have the wrong impression? Well, I think I, I would agree with you. I mean, our philosophy is to, you know, we select sort of a not large group of cities because we try to focus our resources and our energies in those cities. Um, for example, we don't develop unless we have an office. We live and work there. Um, otherwise, we are investors only. And uh, so I think for us, we are different as an investor. We, we're like a lot of other like sovereign wealth funds, pension funds, institutional investors that have the longer term view and have much more of the focus as investors of capital preservation, you know, and this is all, as I said, this is you know, ideally um, a win-win where it helps us to foster these things and obviously it helps the communities as well. Um, but you have to have, I mean, you've got investors like that and they jump in and out. We may jump in and out of individual investments, but mm -hmm. we are still resident in the city and we view ourselves as being resident in the city. And you have to find other investors that are the same. Um, in which case, you may just partner with people who are, you know, only in that city, you know. So that's their livelihood, and so they have the same motivation. Um, and I think it's it's early days to be answering a question like that. This is all fairly new, but I think what's interesting is how quickly the interest and the involvement is building. So I think it's definitely coming. Um, I just think it's early. No, that's a fair answer. I guess, I guess reflecting on that to the, to the full panel, what is the, based on this set of metrics that you're presenting today and, a, and, and the growing understanding of the need for investments that support resilience, governance structures that look at resilience as a key metric, what is the scaling mechanism? How is this going to, I mean, this group of people in this room, I think this is the converted, right? And so, for the most part, I, I don't want to attribute it. I don't know, <laughs> but but I think this is largely the converted. How do you get these concepts? Talking about metrics, how do these scale? Particularly given the challenges of short investment cycles, short political cycles, which are two of the largest, I think, you know, venues you're playing in. Alex, any thoughts on that? Or uh, 
Yeah, I, I was trying to think of a comparable example of you know how do we how do we embed uh, metrics into our daily life even as individuals, right? I mean, your credit rating, um, you know, it, it impacts your ability to borrow money or get a mortgage and the rate you might have to pay. Um, is there a way to embed that deeper into society in the context of resilience? And so perhaps I was talking about this before with a colleague, um, you know, what's the role of rating agencies um, hmm. in, in assessing mm -hmm. your exposure to future events uh, in, is, is using some sort of a metric and how that impact, uh, impacts your ability to, to borrow uh, on a going forward basis and uh, eventually the rate of returns you're gonna see and what impact is that gonna have on, on your shareholder base? Um, I, I, think, I think finding some sort of a, a metric that can be embedded in a very uniform manner across all industries and governments too, mm -hmm. for that matter, right? Because we have to drive that message not only from the bottom up, but from the top down mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. And frankly, government should be rated in a very similar fashion. How is the city of San Francisco doing vis-a-vis uh, -vis other, other municipalities mm -hmm. that are looking to borrow money in the capital markets? Aidan, you were gonna watch yeah. this. Yes, just, just going back to the, the question about how you, would, how you might measure some of this, I think um, it, it, may not, it, it may not be as sophisticated as it sounds because in, in some cases there's a question about is there a plan in place? And I know that that, you know, it, I think, um, so we looked at New Orleans as a case study and a lot of things broke down because the, the, there was no, the formal structure of responding to the emergency or, or to, the, to the hurricane wasn't there. Um, actually, where there were great signs of resilience was the informal, resi the informal um, community coming together and responding. And um, in, in, the, in the private sector, you know, the question about whether, is there a um, business continuity plan in place is a sort of check the box. And then the next sub-indicator would be and does it address the following questions? Because I think most businesses have a business continuity plan in place, but is it in place as a, um, a sort of check the box regulatory mm -hmm. requirement, or is it actually addressing the real vulnerabilities and threats and, and stresses that, that may come along? So these, qu these are really the questions about governance, about you know, is, is the structure there and is there a plan in place and are, do people know about the plan and will it, can it be implemented? Did you have a follow on that time? No, actually, it was just so funny you were saying that. And the whole idea of having business continuity plans or um, you know, emergency preparedness plans, and it reminded me of 9-11 and the fact that all the Wall Street firms ended up being shut down, even though they had already gone through the process of having off-site you know, alternative locations to move to. And it turned out, in many cases, they were basically on the same grid, so they all went down together. Hmm. Um, so, you know, they had done their plans and they thought they had gotten everything set up and in fact it wasn't adequately thought through. And unfortunately, I think, you know, a lot of times it's a learning by doing. It's once you've had that experience, that's one thing you will make sure you don't do again. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, between then and now, you know, it's a painful process. I just want one additional thought. I know I come from this very much from like the financial economic perspective, but something that may help motivate uh, you know, businesses and communities and cities and states, et cetera, is reducing this incredible over-dependence on the federal government, right? Something happens or something doesn't happen, we anticipate something's gonna happen and everybody says, well, I'm not, I don't buy earthquake insurance because FEMA will just bail me out. Or, you know, I mean, and th that example sort of continues through the entire value <laughs> chain of our society. Um, and so if, if there is a societal shift to forcing entities uh, and individuals and communities to own their risk, hmm. absorb the risk that they have, and not become dependent on the p possibility that the federal government may one day come back and pay me for what I lost, which I think is becoming increasingly a fallacy, right? Because now we have a you know, record number of disasters every single year, they're more expensive, and at some point, um, you know, the bow's gonna break, and FEMA's gonna say, you know what, we're done. Um, and so if we force people to sort of own that risk, then they'll take, they'll take uh, much more relevant decisions. And you know, it's a, actually, it's funny you should bring that up because I was, I, and I wrote down own the risk. Um, I don't know how many people are familiar with what happened at FEMA a couple of years ago. Uh, they actually tried to go and, and increase premiums. 
Uh, mm -hmm. They went to Congress, they got it approved. Um, and then, of course, there was a revolt once those premiums got rolled out. And they're now, I think, studying Stu is it studying we, the issue? Is that study the, it. Study um, hold. Um, but they're, you know, they're, they're in the red, and they're not legally supposed to do that. And this is one of the things that came up with risky business again and again, was this notion of owning the risk, which is another way of saying pricing risk, really. And so, and one of the things we looked at, and that the risk committee members, such as Bob, former Treasury Secretary Bob Rubin and Hank Paulson, um, and some of our outside uh, reviewers, Larry Linden, who was the chief risk uh, analyst for Goldman Sachs for many years, it's this notion of getting prices right in the marketplace. And I think as much as, you know, I, 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 I think the thing that struck me about some of these reports is how you're getting into some of the soft sciences about well-being mm -hmm. uh, and other metrics. But at the end of the day, the market responds to prices. So, so let, me, let me pivot a little bit about where are some of the price signal mechanisms that are measurable in these different attributes that you guys have measured where maybe we could do a better job of explaining to people that there is a benefit, an economic benefit to resilience. And, and some of these are very obvious, such as increased real estate values near transit systems. I mean, that's sort of the common. Mm -hmm. you know, but there's, there, there's got to be a whole chain of these that can be expressed in the hard language of dollars um, that, that people understand in a very immediate way. You know, some of those things, as you said, you know, they're soft. and. Um, you know, I think you look at outcomes, it can be something as general as um, the withdrawal of investors from Argentina because it's becoming increasingly um, not friendly to investors. Mm -hmm. um, you know, especially after they took over the YPF Repsol um, holding a couple of years ago. And uh, so this current administration is very much viewed as, you know, not friendly to uh, incoming investment or not predictably friendly to incoming investment, and so they're just not seeing the investment dollars. Um, so you have things like that that are obvious signals, but you know, that's very macro. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it's very hard. A lot of these issues, you know, they're measurement issues, um, you know, kind of connecting the dots. You were talking a minute ago about, you know, the whole question of owning the risk, and I was thinking about the fact that, unfortunately, in the United States, it's like, land use planning and zoning is a local government function yep, yep. and FEMA is the federal government. So the local government gets pushed by, you know, the local politics and they let people build in the floodplain. And of course, you know, the implicit assumption is FEMA will rescue us. Well, and, when and even worse than that, um, FEMA moved the lines. I don't know if people knew this story, but there was a flood map and they actually relocated the flood lines under pressure from people who owned land in those areas. So mm -hmm. you have the political interfering with yeah. the metrics what do you do in those cases where the, where the political power dynamic actually doctors the metrics? I mean, anybody who's, who's worked in developing countries, this is something that's sort of a constant challenge. And it's not, and it's not just the fast-growing nations. It's right here at home, too. That's a tough one. <laughs> touch that one. We're all waiting for your answer, Alex. I don't know. How do you influence the, the, the politicians I don't know. I mean, it's a question of what's the, you know, the market needs numbers to operate. Transparency and accuracy of metrics is a key part of a functioning market. And we have examples in the development sphere, both domestically and overseas, where you're looking at the metrics and you're saying, FEMA actually relocated the line on the map under pressure from somebody who owned the land with it on the wrong side of the line. Well, um, yeah. What's, a little I mean, gerrymandering. Or the mayor. It's, it's case I mean, yeah. mayor. The, 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 I mean, you were talking, you're saying, saying FEMA, you, you're talking about the NFIP. You know, I, I feel bad for the guys that run it because they're trying to run an insurance company through the, through the prism of congressional wisdom. And, <laughs> you know, and so the ball gets, keep, keeps getting moved on. I mean, you're like, oh, we should totally, you know, make this a sustainable pro, uh, uh, program with actuarial rates. But wait a minute. So-and-so might, my, my, you know, my highest contributor is now paying three times what he was paying before, so we, now we got to do away with that. Um, yeah, it, it's it's a the perennial question of how do we uh, how do we extract politics from good public policy, and I don't I don't know what the answer is. Well, because in, in other in other areas of both of your reports, uh, you mentioned the I mean clearly there's a deep role of planning and zoning. Um, uh, step away from FEMA, you know, cities are, what, what is a city? It's a government system that offers services to, to the people, including planning and zoning. And, and if the metrics aren't matching the reality, that's got to create a real challenge in achieving mm -hmm. some resilience goals. Yeah, I, surprisingly, I don't have an answer, but 
you know, <laughs> the solution. But I think it's, it's interesting. T there was a discussion this morning about sustainability and resilience. And this, you know, is resilience is now a new thing. Sustainability was a new thing. And, and is it now just something that we do day to day? Some of the lessons I think that we might take from that is that, is that um, having a framework to have the conversation having those conversations and beginning to raise public pro the public perception begins to get you to a place where, where the, the, the public can influence um, the politicians. It's a very long process, clearly. And I wouldn't say that we're there at all in terms of sustainability either, but um, that, that's um, came out, you know, I have a background in planning, so you might have expected me to say all this. <laughs> which is this it's a really, a, it's a long process, and it's a question of sort of continuing to have the conversations, but having, a, having them around frameworks that engage people uh, at all levels. It's not just about trying to engage a politician. I guess the best way to get their attention is for their constituents to be demanding that they do something. Sorry, I was just going to say, you know, and, and keeping it contextual to this actual this, this conference, I mean, the role of cities is incredibly important. We keep on talking about, I think, the, the federal context where you've got, you know, 535 members of Congress um, and with all diverging interests. You know, the people in Iowa really don't care about what the, the flood insurance looks like in Florida. Um, but cities, as the economic drivers of national economies, have an incredibly powerful role and the ability to get stuff done on a very localized basis. And if we can begin the process of, of achieving small gains at the municipal level or the city level, um, then hopefully that will sort of percolate throughout the entire system. So I don't think, we're, my, my point is, I don't think we're gonna f solve this at the, at the federal scale, mm -hmm. but really, you know, looking at cities like New York and New Orleans and San Francisco and, and what they're doing mm -hmm. in their own communities I think that's tremendously important, and that's where the, our, our, our focus should be. Well, let, let me ask a question based on that, because I, I can't remember whose report mentioned the, the degree to which cities obviously, and it's common knowledge, rely on federal funding for various transportation, infrastructure, mm -hmm. um, the, the, all the grants. Uh, should cities have more influence in political power, just in general? Is that, I mean, it seems like that's a trend that's coming, but we have, I think we can all think of examples in, in this country and, and overseas where where cities have less influence than they might. Well, let me just jump in and say it's an interesting observation, and I think um, cities can be tremendously influential. And I myself was incredibly impressed with the aftermath of Sandy mm -hmm. and the reaction and all the work that came out of that. Um, and it was the city of New York, but also they wrapped in HUD. I mean, there was a lot of involvement on, on the part of a lot of different agencies at different levels. And, um, you know, unfortunately, a lot of times that kind of leadership emerges when you've had, you have to have the catastrophe and then the leadership, you know, right. steps in to, to react to it. And hopefully, if you do have, you know, sort of these, uh, these things in place where you've got the government with the capacity and the leadership, et cetera, et cetera, um, and you know, have uh, people's say in what's going on, that they turn it into an opportunity to do much more. Um, instead of just, you know, the example I was reading uh, an article about some of the things that came out of um, you know, the aftermath and the response to Sandy, uh, let's not just rebuild all the barriers and make them higher, let's rethink how we're actually responding to this particular natural disaster, which is a recurring phenomenon here and we know will happen again. And uh, you know, how can we think about it differently and bring the community in and it's a way for them to understand how this all works and some of their own behavior probably is contributing to the issues. You know, you're building mm -hmm. out into, onto the sand dunes and you, you're putting yourself at risk. And uh, you get a much better outcome, but it's also partly because you took that opportunity to think outside the box and do something more than just rebuild exactly what was there before the natural disaster occurred. Um, and I think that's you know, one of those signs where you do truly have leadership that can maybe be built into something else. Um, a lot of times you hear about the fact that the states in the United States are often the, the source of um, new initiatives in Congress at the federal level. You know, the state governors are out doing things. It's like, well, the federal government isn't responding to our problem, therefore we're going to try X, mm -hmm. and X ends up being really successful, so then it you know, gets 
taken up by other states perhaps and ultimately goes up to the federal level. And so it is an opportunity maybe to do that at the city level, but also having a background in planning. Then I have to say, how are you defining city? Because one of the issues we have is like the Bay Area. You know, as the director of research, someone will come in and say, oh, well, I just read this article and, you know, the world is ending because this is happening in the Bay Area. I said, well, how are they defining the Bay Area? Is it the three county San Francisco? Is it the nine county, you know, a bag definition? Is it the, and so, you know, that's the whole issue with a lot of these things. It's if you've got a large crisis that overlaps these different local boundaries, then how do you actually effectively come up with an integrated solution that works for the region? And one of the good things Miami has, it's Miami-Dade. I mean, right. there are certain cities that have you know, tried to you know, capture the fact that they're now regional entities, but that's always an issue when you get into, you know, at least in the United States, these larger areas, larger urbanized areas where the political boundaries don't necessarily reflect very well what's going on and how it really should work. Transportation is a classic example, mm -hmm. of course. Aiden, I'm going to wrap up with you because I think Eileen has teed something up that I think was reflected in your report, which is how do we go about gauging those government structures that are set up to achieve the objectives that she sort of broadly outlined? I think you, you, you get at some of those. Um, what should people be looking for uh, in, in, civil, in, in civil society that's going to help accelerate the spread of these ideas? Yeah, I, I, I think in, in, in the, the broader category of leadership and strategy, which you could also call governance, I guess, is um, that th this point about the cities are very different. I, I mean, in, in the Bay Area, I guess we tend to think of San Francisco as, you know, the, it's the city, but some of us- uh, uh, You mean Oakland, right? <laughs> okay. Sorry. Oakland. Oakland, close <laughs> second. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> um, but some of us, some of us, um, you know, smaller cities, uh, when when tested against stresses, will will come up short because, oftentimes, they don't have some some of the political structures that they have, um, some of the um, such as kind of revolving the revolving mayoral um, situation as opposed to, you know, the term term mayors and um, mm. their ability, their, their access to, to capital or funds, the makeup, the, the balance of uh, jobs and housing, the availability of affordable homes. Um, there's, a, there's a range of things in the smaller cities that will begin to demonstrate that they're not necessarily in governance terms able to, uh, to respond to some of the stresses and, and um, shocks that, that, are, that could potentially happen. Not, not just earth, I'm going beyond earthquake. So I think most, most cities have a response in place with earthquake. Mm -hmm. Well, I would say that actually, you know, the richer cities have a much stronger plan to deal with earthquakes mm -hmm. than the poorer cities. Yes. And, th and, you know, that has to be an issue for, um, for, the, for us as a society as well. Mm -hmm. Well, th it's a fascinating discussion. I could go on for hours because this is one of my favorite topics, but we are going to open it up for questions uh, and then we'll break for lunch in about 20 minutes. If, if you have a question, there's a microphone here and a microphone here. Um, so first in line, please. Hi, uh, Matt Gonzer with the University of Hawaii Sea Grant Program. My question is for Eileen. In the report, it notes that the American cities ranked uh, highly for adaptive capacity, not necessarily because of their proactive planning systems, but mostly because of their ability to get um, money flowing back into the system. So say three years or six years or nine years into the future when you're refreshing this, if they're still doing better on one type of adaptive capacity versus another one, is there some kind of waiting to say like we're actually concerned about the sustainability over the long term of how they're practicing their resiliency? Um, actually, that was something I didn't mention, but it's something we've already discussed um, internally. Because, um, of course, this was done, it's sort of the, okay, let's put this out there, it's the stake in the ground, we're going to start using it, and we want the regions to start using it, and we're looking at all of these things. And one of the questions is, everything in this is weighted equally, and is that really appropriate? And so that's one of the things we're going to be working on. And, you know, one of the questions with that is, some of that we probably will have to figure out over time, 
as we see how it evolves. And our thought is we'll refresh this every three years. It's not something you're constantly going to update. Um, but that's a, a very good question. And I would also say, being the North America person and looking at some of the measures and some of the detailed data, once you're not having to worry about coverage for the 50 cities across the globe, I can do a much more definitive analysis of some of these things. And you know, then the question is, how does that move the needle? And if I come up with quite a different result, how do, how do we interface with the UK? Um, because they're using their measures um, at a more macro mm. level. So we're sort of throwing all these things around and we don't have answers yet mm. because we've just really started down this road. But it's a classic case where it's complicated, it's messy, but you have to start somewhere. And that's basically where we are. We're starting somewhere. Hi, thanks for sharing your time and all of your thoughts on the subject. My question has to do specifically with the role of risk in the conversation and the emphasis on it. In the work and research that I've done on the subject on resiliency, I've found that in some cases, regular exposure to natural hazards and understanding of those effects can actually make a community or a country more resilient to those impacts. For example, in Iceland, um, a country that's regularly racked with hurricanes, earthquakes, volcanoes, there's a certain understanding of change as a constant condition that has to be negotiated when it comes rather than something to which you have to bounce back after an event happens. Given that, I'd love to hear your thoughts on the emphasis of risk in this conversation about resiliency and if it might be helpful or um, uh, useful to some degree to maybe use a different word. I, um, I'll speak to, to an example uh, I don't know that I would, I'm not sure if it's about, if it's risk per se, but uh, some of the work that we've done with the Rockefeller Foundation in the Philippines um, has, has identified the resilience of some of the communities that annually suffer um, inundation from flood and every year uh, come back from that. And the, the, um, the Philippine government is is now using that as a uh, as a way to encourage people to invest in the Philippines so it's not to say we always flood stay away it's we always flood we're, we're a resilient society mm. we can cope with these stresses and shocks we have the sophistication to do that so if you invest here you, you're investing in a place that is that that has the um, has a robustness to uh, to maintain that investment over time. So I, I think that speaks to the, the question that you're addressing. Interesting. It's almost a way of saying, you know, there's a, I think in, in Silicon Valley that people invest more in entrepreneurs who failed more. Mm -hmm. Right? And not, 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 that, not that an impact is a failure, but you sort of earned your lumps and so you're more capable of responding. I think that that was sort mm -hmm. of the nature so of the question. It's an important point about sort of the severity and, and the the frequency of these events, right? I mean, people that are constantly bombarded with these disasters, take the Caribbean, I mean, it's every single year, it's got something big going on. Now, I wouldn't say they're resilient economies, but I think as, as a population, they're fairly resilient to hurricanes and earthquakes. We take for the US, for example, mm -hmm. most of the major disasters that truly impact us are high severity events, right? Major hurricanes, major earthquakes. We haven't had a major hurricane in the United States in nine years. That's the longest stretch of low activity since the Civil War. Um, wow. Memory is short, right? Sandy was a big event, but it, it wasn't a hurricane really when it made landfall. Hmm. Um, and so um, you basically have two years after one of these majorly severe events to, to take action. Um, and so, I'm not advocating for higher frequency <laughs> 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 to create resilience, but, but point taken, yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. Or greater um, severity. Yeah. We're going to go to a question over here. Uh, Will Travis, I've spent most of my professional career working in coastal management, and uh, this data seems to confirm what I've concluded, which are coasts are incredibly stupid places to have cities. <laughs> Uh, you're either going to get wiped out with a hurricane or an earthquake or a mudslide or a forest fire or a riot or now sea level rise. Uh, yet we are seeing that Americans are moving from the heartland to the coasts. 
and rationally, they should be moving in the other direction, especially because we found that the wind blows a lot in the middle of the country, unfortunately at night, and we can't store that energy. So if we could just have all those people work at night and sleep during the day, we'd have a perfect society. <laughs> Which is my way of saying that you seem to be focusing, appropriately so, on the left side of the brain. And Unfortunately, or fortunately, we do have a right side of the brain, and we are making decisions that also take into account things like aesthetics, which are why people live in these incredibly stupid places. <laughs> uh, so there, if you can extract a question from this, I would appreciate it. Uh, but I'm just saying that I feel your pain, and uh, but I think we have to recognize that we are dealing with a complex species that is looking at both rational information, which you're focusing on, and then making some decisions simply because things are more beautiful some places than others. Thank you. I think the question is about behavioral economics. That's exactly what it is about. <laughs> <laughs> Comments from the panel? Well, I was going to say, um, People like living near water. I mean, it's very clear. But you know, there are ways of doing it. It's, it's sometimes it's not what you do; it's how you do it. You know, there's a big difference between building a condo on the fill that's along the edge of the bay that was put in place 80 years ago, and building on bedrock on top of Knob Hill. So, I mean, there are mitigating factors that you can take into account. You can try to buttress to the extent possible, but. Um, I think what you've already said is absolutely true. People like living near water, and they're going to live near water. You just have to figure out how to make hmm. it work as best you can. Yeah, there's, there's great examples all over the globe. I mean, Rot Rotterdam is a great example mm -hmm. of, of, of a city that lives with water uh, every single day, and, and they're world class about it. And, and you know, hopefully, uh, through programs like 100 Resilient Cities, you know, those best practices can be shared. Another example is, is take you know, uh, Chile versus Haiti. Now, I know they're dramatically different economies, but the point is, is in 2010, Haiti had a 7.0 earthquake and 220,000 people were killed. Uh, in Chile, they had an 8.8, .8, I think was the, the magnitude of the earthquake, and 500 people died. Mm -hmm. um, so what was the big difference? And I think it's because of Chile's experience in the 1960s when they had an equally big earthquake and it changed the entire landscape of that country and their mindset. So they started planning differently. So sometimes the, you know, resilience is born out of, uh, out of true disaster. I, I sense a theme, I wanna to get to the next question, but there seems to be a theme and it's something that uh, is bubbling up both in academic circles, but also trickling into finance and economics, is this notion of a whole other set of metrics around human behavior and decision making. Um, there's a fellow by the name of Eric Beinhocker who some of you might be familiar with. He used to be at McKinsey for many years, but he started an institute at Oxford called the Institute for New Economic Thinking that talks about how do you actually start to quantify not just natural system values, which I think is a common theme of everything we're saying, but these other values, such as why do, what, how do people put a value on living uh, in the heartland versus living on the coast, and actually starting to try to quantify those sort of unquantifiable um, measures. It's a fascinating topic. I don't know that we, we're going to get at it today, but um, <laughs> something that clearly is of interest to the, to the room. Uh, the next question over here. Sure. Um, this, this sort of builds on what you were just saying, because I, I'm from New Orleans. I work for uh, Greater New Orleans, Inc., and we actually were the organization that led the so-called revolt in Washington against um, Bigger Waters um, and NFIP. And the reason why we did that is because we have, um, the, the reason why people live on our coast is they work on our coast. So our coast is not a vacation coast. It mm -hmm. is a coast of jobs um, in energy sector, fisheries, mm -hmm. commerce. And that's a completely different dynamic um, from making a decision to have a vacation home in a place that repetitively floods. And the issue that we had is that we had uh, communities, entire communities that had rebuilt or had never flooded, um, and then all of a sudden the lines changed in the FEMA flood maps. And all of a sudden those communities were um, now vulnerable to significant um, premiums 
um, for uh, flood insurance. And one of the issues, and this goes back to what are we measuring and who's deciding what we're measuring, is that we have local governments that invested in flood control, invested their own money in flood control that the federal government didn't recognize. And so we do have um, a precedent of, of, yeah, we get it. We, we got tons of federal <coughs> money, but we also know that we're not going to get tons of federal money you know, forever. And so we've started investing. Those investments were not recognized. So, so the question is sort of how, how are we deciding which measures are the measures that are going to be accepted? That wasn't for me. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like an insurance guy. Well, I, 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 I can try. Um, no, f f a very fair point. Um, and I know that there are definitely circumstances and stories throughout the United States in that context of, of, the, of the flood program. I would say that that's probably where the role of government is actually quite important, right? Uh, because if it's just the insurance industry, we are going to price the risk based upon your ability to avoid disaster, right? And so we're not always going to take into account the fact that a city like New Orleans um, is a major economic contributor to half the country, right? I mean, everything comes in and out of the, the port of New Orleans. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's not really gonna show up in, in you know, probabilistic models and, and things of that sort. So there's a role for public policy to make distinctions uh, for where uh, assets need to be deployed and, and the, the amount of the risk that you must absorb on your own versus the same risk that's yours that others should own because you're basically feeding their economies. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's so hmm. maybe that's uh, a good idea for where the sort of the public and private space comes together nicely. Um, I don't know what the solution is. I know, I mean, you know, the flood we'll program has a long way to go, but <laughs> you know, we'll pick that up later. We have time for one more question, and it looks like we have a more questioner. Hi, I'm Nicole Boothman Shepherd, and I lead Jacobs Engineering's uh, resilience practice for North America. And I spent seven years in New Orleans, so um, I, I, I'm defending them. I, so I wanted to I have a question, and we started to talk about maximum credible events. That's what you talked about, Alex. Those are the ones that destabilize economies and that we saw. I mean, New Orleans was not a maximum credible event, but the impact was, right? We saw their bond rating fall to a D. Um, and so I, so I want to make sure that that's part of the conversation, because that's where cities and states are the most vulnerable, and that's what inhibits the, the breakdown of essential government services, roadways, sewage treatment facilities, the infrastructure, and <clears throat> utilities that we rely on so that people individually can recover and get back to work. And uh, so that's one of my questions, sort of how do we do that in the conversation? And I'm really glad that you just talked about the intersection and integration between public and private sector conversations. Because at this point, the conversation, I don't think, is about whether or not the federal government's gonna participate. They do, but the, the issue is that their drivers are economic only. And, and I spend all of my time talking to my primarily public sector clients about disaster funding. That's what I advise them on. And the challenge is that only now, since Sandy, are we able to have a conversation that looks at triple bottom line issues, right? So the economic evaluation that's done with FEMA for infrastructure or with the Federal Highways Administration is, how much is it going to put back, is it going to cost if we lose that road in a 25-year event or 50-year event? Not how many people live behind that line and will no longer be able to get home or how many jobs or communities are impacted when that roadway blows out. So I think that this conversation moves the needle forward, and the more we do that, the more we'll have more holistic, integrated solutions that make sense. So uh, I want to hear about that. And then one more thing, uh, just on the Bigley Waters thing. I, I live in Florida, so 40% of my uh, mortgage payment goes to insurance. And that's fine for me, because I can absorb that shock financially. But I, I think the point about people working where they live makes sense. And um, let's remember that the subsidy for NFIP only supports houses up to $250,000. Right. So we're not talking about subsidizing someone's $5 million second home. Yep. We're talking about working, working class, middle class families just making ends meet. And that's what that does. And I'm not saying it's the solution, but it's what we need to live with now. Yep. One clarification on that. You're right. You're absolutely right that the policy limit is only $250,000. But a $5 million home will also have to buy that, that policy as well. Yeah. And then they buy insurance above that, right? 
So, so the, the risk of losing that $250,000 on a $5 million home is far greater than losing $250,000 on a $500,000 home. Um, I, I think you know, the, the point you were making about um, the, sort of the triple bottom line, I, I kind of look at this conversation as, as physical resilience, social resilience, mm -hmm. and economic <clears throat> resilience. And I think all three of those things are equally important. We shouldn't just be talking about um, retrofitting for, size, for seismic activity. We shouldn't just be talking about affordable housing, but we should also be talking about how do we pay for this stuff when our bond rating goes to D, right? right? And, and, and how do we not strap future generations with the expense of our bad decisions today? I mean, I guess that's a societal question that we need to answer in the future. And so what we're trying to say is, while you should be building seawalls and planning affordable housing in smart, uh, smart ways, you should also be figuring out how to pre-finance these disasters. We know that they're going to happen, so why are we waiting to raise taxes on the back end or issue debt post-event? or raid the budget and take the money away from building that state-of-the-art hospital because now we have to go over here and build this bridge, right? So pre-finance these disasters. It's the same philosophy, plan ahead. Um, and, and you know, for me, I think that's where insurance comes in um, at, at, all, at all levels within the value chain. Interesting. Hmm. Any final comments from the panelists? Um, I did ask the panel to indulge me uh, briefly um, because we are in San Francisco. Uh, and there is a city that sprouts in the desert uh, a couple hundred miles from here, uh, north of Reno, uh, every, every year about this time. It's Black Rock City. Uh, it is uh, created from dirt. Uh, they build an entire city with streets and infrastructure, and they take it down, and it goes away, and you never knew it was there. Um, and uh, for those of you who haven't been, it, it, is, it's, it is Burning Man. Um, and it's the just finished. A number of folks here, I think, might have actually been there. But there's a, a, an author, Italo Calvino, who wrote this book, Invisible Cities. Um, I hope you all get a chance to look at it. But he wrote a story about resilience, or a series of stories about resilience, and it reminded me of BlackRock and of this conversation. Um, if you choose to believe me, good. Now I will tell you how Octavia, the spider web city, is made. There is a precipice between two steep mountains. The city is over the void, bound to the two crests with ropes and chains and catwalks. You walk on the little wooden ties, careful not to set your foot in the open spaces, or you cling to the hempen strands. Below there is nothing for hundreds and hundreds of feet. A few clouds glide past. Farther down you can glimpse the chasm's bed. This is the foundation of the city, a net which serves as passage and as support. All the rest, instead of rising up, is hung below. Rope ladders, hammocks, houses made like sacks, clothes hangers, terraces like gondolas, skins of water, gas jets, spits, baskets on strings, dumbwaiters, showers, trapezes and rings for children's games, cable cars, chandeliers, pots with trailing plants. Suspended over the abyss, the life of Octavia's inhabitants is less uncertain than in other cities. They know the net will last only so long. Thanks. Thanks.